So got a few people coming in and so we'll just, we'll jump in. Uh, so I'm Ashley, I'm the founder of Soma Educational Group and Healthy Kitchen Happy Life. Um, Soma Educational Group facilitates workshops and seminars and training programs um, under the integrative wellness bubble. And uh, one of our most prominent programs to date has been the, well, what's now known as the Soma Therapy Program. Um, and we've run that program here in New York for uh, a little over eight years. Uh, we were the first to offer the program in the States, actually. <laughs> and that was with Guy Voyer, um, himself teaching. And it's been an absolute honor to bring this material and make it accessible to practitioners. Um, but it's an even bigger honor to, uh, you know, almost 10 years later to still be offering the program and with our newest instructor here in New York, and that's Terry Frangopoulos. Cheers. So welcome, Terry. <laughs> and for those of you that don't know Terry yet and haven't had the pleasure of learning from him just yet, um, he is the founder of Soma Fit in Roslyn, New York, and a physical therapist and Soma practitioner for over 15 years now, Terry? Look, 20 years PT, but I wow. think with the group, I've been eight years now. Okay, I think wow. I joined the second class, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, it's a long time. That's how, that's how I met you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, Terry, when I first met Guy, um, and was exposed to soma therapy personally, uh, it was very, very unique to me. I had never experienced anything like that. And um, as you know, I, I live with Sjogren's, which is a chronic and systemic autoimmune disease, and it affects the entire body. Um, just just and, interrupt for one second. Guy talks about yeah. your story every time. Does he yeah. really? <laughs> yeah. Well, there's a lot to talk about. There's a lot of, there's a lot of fun issues that come with, uh, with this disease, so I'm sure. Um, he always says my tissue. I've, I've heard him say, your tissue is like, like concrete, like an 80-year-old woman. <laughs> so, um, but there's matter. moments where it's gotten really good. And when, I, when I'm really good about seeing my soma therapist and doing my, my exercises at home, he, he definitely sees the difference. So it's all on me really right now. But, um, but you know. It is happy hour, by the way, right? What's that? It is happy hour, yes. Happy hour in New York. Yes. <laughs> Don't judge. I'm drinking water, no judgment. I want everyone to have a cocktail or a mocktail yeah, on them yeah, right now. Different times. <laughs> it's Friday. So, but in any case, as you know, I've been able to make a lot of um, progress with nutrition and some other practices that I've incorporated. But one of the biggest things is that um, having access to a soma therapist has been really a game changer for me because I could have uh, months of, you know, weeks to months of feeling really great and then suddenly have really, really bad joint pain um, to the point where the walking is sort of difficult and restriction in movements. And my first go-to is to see a soma therapist. And that's kind of how Soma Educational Group got started was the fact that I couldn't believe so many people didn't have access to this kind of um, tool set from their practitioners. And um, so, you know, there's a number of reasons that I still see my soma therapist to treat tracheal stenosis, the flares from the autoimmune disease. Um, recently, when I removed the thyroid, I, as soon as it was safe, as soon as Guy said it was safe to see someone for treatment, I did just to make sure that we kept the scarring um, as minimal as possible. Um, so safe to say, autoimmune or not, seeing or working with a soma therapist um, is, it's, I, I almost want to say necessary, <laughs> given the way we live our lives today. But um, it's beneficial for almost anyone, wouldn't you agree? 
Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, I always say that uh, regardless of if I was still in this profession or not, I mean, what, I, I see I seen you on a personal level. So uh, what he's done for me is, uh, you know, 10 years into the program, I guess, eight years, I feel much better than I did uh, at 35, for sure. Yeah. But um, so go ahead. So yeah, so before we dive into what somatherapy, fascia, and osteoarticular pumping is, you know, let everyone know a little bit about how you stumbled upon Guy Voyer, uh, the somatherapy program, and the whole paradigm. Uh, pretty randomly, uh, an old employer of mine uh, had texted me, uh, said, uh, there's this French guy who's teaching this Eldoa class. Uh, you should go check him out. And it's the first time and the last time I heard from this guy, I guess, two years after I stopped working there. So he wasn't giving a formal education type of program like some uh, some educational group. He was just giving workshops, basically. He just came to the States, I guess. Uh, so that first class I took with him uh, was uh, the 22 axes of the SI joint, sacroiliac joint. So if anybody's ever listened to that lecture, it's it, it's disheartening. It's it's impossible to follow, <laughs> especially back then when he basically didn't speak much English. So you know, there's 50 people jammed in a little class in the city, in a little room, and I remember. Uh, at one point, I looked behind me, and everybody's eyes were just looking anywhere except for Guy. Okay, and so he went over the 22 axes, uh, and then at the last day, he went over myofascial stretching and held down for the sacroiliac joint and the L5-S1. So I had gone up to him the first time I spoke to him, and I said, Guy, I have no idea what you said in the first two classes, the first few days. <laughs> and he had just said, oh, don't worry about it, no problem. Uh, just give him everything. So I went back to clinic, and uh, I remember I had a... Uh, some soccer player and uh, she had a chronic situation with uh, uh, shin splits, anterior compartment syndrome. So I just given her stretch for rec fems, uh, psoas, and a couple of those for the SI joint. And she came back the next week and was like, oh my God, it's amazing. It's not hundred percent cured, but significantly better. I had no idea why at the time, but now after mm -hmm. uh, learning all the anatomy, learning the relationships, uh, it makes complete sense. And why more people don't understand, I have my own theories on that, but um, it, it's a game changer for my practice in terms of uh, what it's done. I'm still in business 20 years later. So, you know, I don't do much yeah. marketing. It's just, it kind of intrinsically grows your practice, I'd say, as long as you work. Yeah. Well, so having said that, you know, osteopathic treatment, at least when I was exposed to it 10 years ago, um, it's, I would say that even today, it's not as common practice for people to see an osteopath here in the States as it is say in Canada or Europe. And so let's kind of start there. What is an osteopath? Okay, well, an osteopath is a, basically a manual therapist who, who really tries to understand the mechanical cause of the disease. Um, he studies the body pretty much in its global, uh, globality. So there's, he studies all the interrelationships of the body rather than, um, you know, there's no relying theme in osteopathy. It's structure governs the function. And, you know, I, when I went to PT school, I, I did my first anatomy class with med students. And that was really the first line in the uh, anatomy book was structure governs function. Except I think a lot, the medical profession has come, kind of come away from that. So it's over specialized now. So you have, you know, you have a heart problem, you go to a cardiologist, you have um, a gastric problem, digestive problem, you go to a gastroenterologist. And they kind of miss the links, which is so important. And at the end of this, uh, I'm actually going to go through two, two case studies that I have right now just to show you how it all uh, fits in and what medicine is doing for it and what uh, traditional PT is doing for it. But I remember uh, one, one instance, I have a lot of physicians as clients somehow, and uh, I had brought them a cardiologist once, I remember, and they spent half the session discussing the heart, the pericardium, all its connections. And at the end of the session, the cardiologist, uh, it was a good, very good cardiologist in, in my neighborhood, uh, he said, listen, Guy, I don't know where it attaches. All I do is put stents in all day. I look at the numbers, and the numbers are off, you get medication. And, and you know, he said, yeah, that's your job. He's a great cardiologist. That's, that's what he does. But, um, you know, there's a lot of inter, interconnection or globality to the system. Like, I have very, you know, anybody, a lot of times, you know, when I, when I talk to, to clients and they, they have a long history of cervical problems, uh, it's, it's rare to find if it's over a few years, five years, seven years, uh, that they don't also have an associated problem with the heart because there's a lot of links mm -hmm. with the middle cervical fascia, the thyroid, um, it's all in links. So, you know, you influence one part of the, one end of the tissue, some parts gonna pay. So that, that's 
the kind of relationship I started to make uh, over these last few years with the uh, with the training, with the with the education. And that's know. the that's the biggest link because, you know, you're you're going to speak today as a trained physical therapist who then added so soma therapist to not only your name but your, you know, your um, toolbox, and and I'm speaking today basically from a patient perspective and my experience from it. And that is the missing link is that we go from specialist to specialist and they're only looking at that one area when the whole body works together. And that's- I'm, gonna, I'm actually gonna go into, not to cut you off, but I'm actually gonna go into yeah. how it all relates. Yeah, um, and it's just such a simple, it's a simple concept that the whole body is in link and connected, but unfortunately that's kind of the status quo right now. And that's why it's important to keep, you know, programs like these running because there's so many great practitioners who can just basically level up um, and help patients even more so. So what or how does traditional osteopathy and Guy Voyer's approach differ, would you say? Okay. Uh, you know, I have spoken to other osteopaths about it, and there is a little bit of a riff between uh, Guy Voyer and other osteopaths. And let me just say one thing. I mean, because I, I saw him personally for a knee problem, and I have many nicknames throughout the program for it, but uh, he's got a really gifted understanding of, of the anatomy, of the interrelationships between uh, all, the, all the links throughout the body from head to toe. Um, and he, he's got this, I mean, I think there's a, a, par a general theme in osteopathy that the body has an inherent uh, ability to heal itself if you give it the right tools, if you put it in the right environment. Uh, so I don't think that's unique to him. Uh, I think his understanding of the uh, anatomy and the diagnostics and the relationships is definitely second to none. Uh, but I think the biggest thing he's done is he's bridged the gap between uh, manual therapy, whether it be PT, chiro, osteopath, and exercise. Um, yeah. So, for, like for me, I didn't see him every. He was only in the, in the states every few months, so I'd see. I saw him twice, and he had given me some program that I was very compulsive about, and uh, I'd see plenty of specialists at HSS, and uh, it was it was amazing. That's when I bought all in. So I was traveling yeah. everywhere to study with him for, you know, six years, six, seven years. So uh, he's bridged that gap, so that yeah, you get the treatment, and the treatments are great, uh, but without the uh, the maintenance of it between treatments, it, it doesn't make sense. You know, it's kind yeah, of- it's not always, Right, not all of us have access to seeing a somatherapist all the time, or or even if you did, um, the, the benefits of being able to go home after treatment and sustain the benefits from that treatment, and then continue to be somewhat preventative through the exercises that you've been sent home with, I mean, right. that's huge, right? That's kind of- huge more than half the battle at, at that point for anyone. And I think what we started to do in the New York program and in Dallas is start to incorporate a little bit of a, like a recipe. Yeah. To, because not everybody has gone through the SOMA training program, but there is some universal exercise you can give that addresses a lot of the right. issues. If it's the lower limb, we give a couple exercises during the class, a couple of those, mm -hmm. uh, because it does help. Like I said, that first year, I didn't know anything. But even the few <laughs> the exercises I had given made a huge difference. So I think... Uh, I think that's important. Yeah, absolutely. So let's dive right in. Okay. What is Nervous. soma therapy? <laughs> I mean, is, is the structure governs the function, but then there's also um, a few pillars that are really important to learn. Because if you can uh, gear your studying towards those pillars, uh, it's a much quicker process. So basically, we have three pillars. Uh, the first pillar is fascia is the link. So by the end of the first year, second year, third year, fourth year, uh, we're all pretty much experts in anatomy. Whether you study or not, by virtue of exposure, uh, over and over and over, um, the level goes up exponentially, to be honest with you. Um, where you can start to talk with physicians, talk to colleagues. Uh, like I said, I have plenty of physicians as clients, and they love to hear about it because, to be honest with you, at least in the American paradigm, like I follow a couple physicians on, on Instagram in Europe and Germany, and they all know this. It, it's so odd to me that here, it's, it's kind of lost its art. It's, it's a very different paradigm, but not to get off the topic. That's a whole, but, that's a whole different uh, conversation. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that so, we could dive into. Go into that. But basically you're becoming an expert in anatomy. 
uh, specifically relationship anatomy. And what exactly that means. So my first class in PT school, straight out of college, right, was uh, a dissection, which in retrospect makes no sense because I've never even looked at an anatomy book yet on dissecting a cadaver. And it was along with the medical students and uh, pretty much the medical students, I think, and the PT students, maybe the PAs too. But, um, mm -hmm. you know, I hated the class. It was vile. You stunk. You couldn't get the stench off of you. Um, so what happens is after the first proto pr uh, practical, I realized that no two bodies are alike. No matter how many you look at, everything's a little different. Like it, the muscle may start in the spinous process, uh, you know, in the in netters of whatever, T12, tail two, and go to the rib. But everyone's a little above, a little below. The vicinity is correct, but no two cadavers are the same. And I realized after the first practical that the instructors would manually move the structures so that it matches the book. So after that, and that's, that's basically what you learn. You learn uh, descriptive anatomy, which is basically learning the origin, the insertion, which is important. You should know that. But more important is the relationships. Um, so I stopped going to class after that. I would just go the day before to look at the cadavers, and then I aced the class just because they know that no two people are alike, and they would actually move the structures. So mm -hmm. relationship anatomy means to make the links, to, to understand how every structure is connected. Classic examples in uh, fascial change osteopathy is if you follow the lateral uh, calcaneus, the lateral uh, uh, gastrox, the bicep femoris, the sacro tuberus, to the transverse spinalis. So that's kind of the link. It's the same tissue. It's given a different name, but if you drop a die in one part of it, it ends up uh, at the other end. So the, 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 the connection is the same. It could be yeah. a different name. And that's pretty much what you start to learn. Uh, another classic example is, uh, uh, you know, when you're looking at the diaphragm, the diaphragm has pillars that go into the lumbar spine, right? So the pillars are actually in continuation with the ligament in front of the vertebrae, which are actually in continuation with all the organs in the, uh, in, in the pelvis, including the rectum, the uterus, the bladder. Uh, so there's a link between the diaphragm, the bladder, and the pubis. So these are the kind of things you start to start to understand, and that makes a huge difference. And especially later today, I'm going to talk about a client who I have uh, who he's recovered COVID. He was on a vent for 12 days. So I'm going to show you how this whole paradigm plays into that and how you can actually have a, a really good niche right now with COVID patients. But um, yeah, yeah, it's all, yeah, it's all very relevant. Yeah. <laughs> and then you always hear about cranial sacral therapy, right? Everybody hears about that. Mm -hmm. But nobody, I don't think, nobody ever spoke to understands why do they call it cranial sacral therapy. And it's basically, you have the sacrum and the occiput. Uh, they're in link. So that's the relationship anatomy. They're in link by the uh, ALL, PLL, Duramass, so Every time one moves, the other moves. So I'm at two ends mm -hmm. of the body. Mm -hmm. And that's what we mean about uh, fascia as a link. So good to know the descriptive, but it's really the links you want to really master. And so the Soma Therapy Program, for those that aren't aware, it's broken down into four levels. The first level um, or year is the osteoarticular pumping, where we cover a full weekend of pumping of the lower limbs, and then a full weekend course on pumping of the upper limbs and TMJ, and then a full weekend course of um, the spine and pelvis. And we follow that same format for year two, which is the fascial normalization series. And then we follow the same format for TTLS, uh, transverse tendinous ligamentous stretching. And then the fourth year, that ties everything together is a four part uh, series. And that is the diaphragm series. And that covers thoracic, cervical thoracic, uh, pelvic and cranial diaphragm. And today, Terry, I'd love for you to take us through each you one of those levels. levels. But, yeah, well, we're gonna get into the fillers for sure. Um, but let's start with osteoarticular pumping. You know, what is it? And Can I just stop you one second, um, Ash? Yeah. Uh, so the pillars were three. I'm not, I don't have to talk about them, but there's a, basically the fascia's a link, the tensegrity biomechanics we learned, and also the complexity model of the system. Oh, so, right, right. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, no, I jumped the gun there. <laughs> I got Nobody excited. Wants to hear them. We can skip them. But, um, no, I got excited. I promise this is water. I just got excited. Right, right, right. Um, all right, so really quickly then, so we don't spend too much time on this. Uh, we, we learned about mechanics and the tensegrity model uh, versus where I learned it in school was uh, based on Newtonian laws, uh, Newtonian physics, which are re really different. Uh, they use lever arms, they use uh, fulcrums, the gravity dependent. 
but intensegrity, um, it, it, it takes into account, the shortcomings of the Newtonian physics was basically that it didn't take the whole organism into relationship, into, uh, into, um, into the formulas, basically. So the calculations that, you know, for simple tasks work well, but once you started thinking about the shoulder, which is a complex movement of different joints, uh, the classic example is fly fishing. Uh, you toss a five kilogram or 10 pound rod into the water, bring up a fish that's 10 pounds. And the forces that you calculated with it were enough to like dislocate the shoulder, uh, rupture the discs. Uh, so really quick, just integrity uh, comes along. It's, uh, by, it's an architectural concept actually by Buckminster Fuller. You're an architect, right? So help me out if you right. like, say anything wrong. But um, um, basically, uh, it's a structure that's imbalanced between tension and pressure. And that's our whole goal, is once we start to learn the relationship anatomy, we start to uh, understand all the tensegrity biomechanics that we teach. Uh, so there's a constant, uh, constant tension uh, that you need to maintain balance with. That's all the soft tissue, the fascia, the muscle, the ligament, the uh, capsule, the bursa, the fascia, uh, with a uh, discontinuous type of compression, which is generally the bones, right? So the management of the tension and the pressure is what the tensegrity structure is. And, and what's interesting is uh, it makes total sense when you start to apply it in, to work with it. Uh, if you have any disruption in the tensional component, any of the soft tissue is disrupted, a tendonitis or anything at all, you change the balance between the tension and the compression and you end up with more compression, per, let's say. So perfect mm -hmm. examples, I had a client the other day, uh, a couple weeks ago, um, history of ten, uh, golfer's elbow, what a tendonitis in the medial of condyle, uh, you know, usual approach, rest, he'd get cortisone shots, he'd play golf, come back, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so he, I got a prescription. This is how doctors work. I got a prescription that's golfer's elbow. So I took a look at it, worked with it. Uh, at the end of the session, it just didn't feel right. It didn't feel like, and the pumping and all these techniques you do are actually diagnostic, right? Because you start to know what's normal, what's not normal, what moves, what doesn't move, uh, the mm -hmm. fluidity of it. And uh, so I sent them back for an uh, x-ray and it came back bone on bone the uh, radio, uh, the only, uh, on the humeral joint. So that goes to show you something as benign as everyone has tendonitis, right? They just ignore them. They play when they can, they come back. Uh, so if you leave that for 10 years, uh, the tension and the pressure changes and you end up with a, you know, osteoarthritis, arthrosis, et cetera. So that's a good way to start to think about tensegrity, you know? And uh, the last uh, paradigm is complexity model. Uh, I didn't understand this for a long time, but it's actually a complexity model of learning, of thinking. Uh, so we basically stopped looking at the body in a linear fashion. Uh, common denominator in all type of uh, complexity models, whether it be global climate, the universe, tide, uh, water tides. Um, it was first applied, I think, to the cellular biology was consecutive, it was first applied. But basically, um, it's a system where it's composed of many parts and those parts all interact in a nonlinear fashion, basically. So there's always an adaptation. There's always a feedback loop. Uh, kind of like when you put a pressure on a tensegrity structure, whether it be a, a geodesic dome or human, the force is transmitted to all the parts evenly. Um, so the same thing, we, we kind of study the relationship anatomy and the tensegrity model where our, st our systems are, are, are global and always interactive. And that's how we start to look at the body, more in a complexity model. That makes mm -hmm. sense. It does. Well, and it does as you start to dive further, further in. It's like, like everyone just heard you say, I didn't understand it at first, but then you start to connect the dots as you go, correct? Yeah, totally. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah. the beauty of it. That's the beauty of it. Yeah. <laughs> the aha moments like, ah. <laughs> so, so shall we dive into osteoarticular yeah, sure. pumping? Okay. Year one. So year one, um, what is articular pumping? That's what people ask all the time. So mm -hmm. it's actually, uh, it's been around for a very long time. Guy did not invent articular pumping. Uh, it's been around in the field of osteopathy. I don't know, for as long as it's been around, I guess. But uh, what Guy has done, it, it used to be only several techniques or a handful, but Guy has expanded it to include like, I think it's over 600 uh, pumping techniques, right? So we can pump. Uh, all types of fascia. We could pump uh, ligaments, tendons, bursas, uh, capsules, synovial uh, membranes. We can even pump uh, uh, synovial fluid through cavi joint cavities. 
uh, so it's basically just the movement. What are we doing with it, basically? Is, is we're trying to mobilize the fluid, right, uh, within the fascia. Mm -hmm. And we'll go into what the fascia is. You have a better understanding of what you're trying to actually do. But uh, so the fascia consists of, let's say, tubes and extracellular matrix and cells. That's the universal thing in all fascia. So with this technique, we're trying to move the fluid through the tissue. Thereby, we increase the exchange of nutrients, waste products, uh, we, we improve the quality of the, of the fascia, whatever fascia we're actually working on. Um, and fascia is like a big buzzword now. I've been hearing it forever, mm -hmm. right? And uh, every time I hear it, everyone's doing myofascial work. Oh, do you do myofascial work? People, and when somebody says that, or when a practitioner says they do myofascial work, everything, people don't realize what fascia is, right? So if you look under a microscope, uh, anytime you touch a body, anytime you stretch, anytime you work out, it's all myofascial. You're always influencing the fascia, right? So our goal in pumping is to move the fluid in, within our fascia to improve the quality of it, right? Mm -hmm. um, everyone's heard like we're 60, 70% 70, 70 water, right, by weight. That, you know, I, I, I didn't know what that meant, but it's in the first page of every physiology book I ever <laughs> opened, right? Um, so basically what that means when you're born, you're 80%. 90 percent uh, and you start to lose water as you age but you know 70 percent by weight uh is a lot right so it almost seems like you should be a puddle of water but you're not and that's because of the fascia a lot of the mm -hmm. water is located uh, within the fascial tubes within the extracellular matrix uh within the vascular system uh, it's all fascia right um so that's that's our first year uh, is we learn about the, just the general relationship anatomy. Uh, we focus a lot on practice. And it's really important that we understand what the inflammatory cycle is that first year, right? Because I think that's a really misunderstood uh, component in sports medicine because you have this protocol, and I get it all the time from that physician, it's, it's rice, right? It's rest, mm -hmm. uh, ice, compression, and elevation. Um, and once you start to understand the inflammatory cycle, which is actually... Uh, your body's defense mechanism. It's your immunity. It's called innate immunity. It's what you're born with versus something you get when you get a vaccine or something, which is adaptive immunity. Uh, so you're actually born with it. It has a big role in this uh, inflammatory cycle. So, well, that, sorry to interrupt, but that sort of, you know, inflammation, the term itself gets such a negative rep because we're thinking, you know, chronic inflammation and consistent inflammation. But in reality, we have to be sort of grateful to inflammation because it's doing something for our body. It's think of something as simple as a running a fever. You know, that's the, that's the body letting you know something is wrong. The body is already raising its temperature um, to fight off infection or whatever the invader is per se. And that is very relative to autoimmune disease. So inflammation is good because it sort of sound, sounds the alarm, you know, it's yeah, the truth I mean ready. Without um, it, you, but it's, you it's when it. we reach consistent chronic inflammation, which is probably what you see most of the time uh, walking in your door at your practice, is, is where the problem with inflammation is. So yeah, dive, dive a little into, into the whole inflammation process um, so that we better understand you know, how your one wraps around okay, that. So the simplest way to understand it is uh, you take the RICE protocol, right? Rest, ice, elevation, compression. Um, and let's take uh, an example of an ankle sprain, right? So I just sprained my ankle. The immediate mm -hmm. response is a swelling, right? Uh, so in order to understand that process now, is you need to understand those three different phases in the inflammatory cycle. Uh, you have a first phase, which is vascular, right? The second cellular, and the third is regenerative. Where the tissue actually starts to heal. So when you first sprain your ankle, uh, you have uh, certain chemicals that are released, histamine, uh, Hagman's factor, which is a coagulatory. So your body's response is really to isolate and encapsulate the area of injury, right? To prevent the swelling, to keep it down. It vasoconstricts the artery. Perfect sense to add ice at this point, right? Because what does ice do? It vasoconstricts. So you're going in accordance with your body's natural process. You want to elevate, keep the swelling down. The, unfortunately, that, that phase only lasts, I think, about uh, 12 hours, half a day. Some a little more, some a little more. Everyone's immune response is a little more sensitive or less sensitive. Um, so yeah, ice at that point, right? Makes sense. But then all you see on TV, all you hear athletes doing is icing, icing, people ice at the end, PT ice at the end. 
Um, but once you start to understand the second phase of this first uh, vascular uh, phase is there's a, your body's starting to, so that time is really to organize your body's response, right? So that's why they close off the area. Now your body wants to send a ton of cells into it, mostly immune cells, macrophages, um, uh, leukocytes, uh, et cetera, uh, lymphocytes. So at this point, you have uh, other systems that work, a kidney system, which is uh, basically to keep the inflammation going. So your body's trying to keep the vasodilation, right? So it wants to shuttle things there. Uh, another system is the complement system, which enhances your immune system, uh, your immune response. Uh, so the whole goal of the body at this point, after 12 hours, is to mobilize a lot of fluid, a lot of cells to the area to help clean it up, start to regenerate eventually. Uh, so to put ice on that doesn't make sense. And what pumping is amazing at is it helps to stimulate that movement, flu uh, fluid movement, right? So it, the result is amazing when you get a swollen, whether it's chronic or acute. Within a session, uh, the change is remarkable. Uh, you can literally pump the fluid right out of the joint. And the, the pain, I, I, of course, goes away because when you get swelling, you start to stretch the fascial tissue. And that's where you, know, you start to get the pain when you, when you start to put too much tension on it. Um, so essentially so, the icing, you know, there's a, there's a, there's an appropriate time for the icing and there's a very sure. inappropriate time because it almost, it essentially interrupts the healthy inflammation process. Yeah. Right. 100% like, because if you're trying to vasodilate, uh, innately, uh, to put ice on, it doesn't make sense. You're just kind of like trying to fight your own body. So mm -hmm. to pump and actually move the flow, like my story with Guy is, uh, I used to get swelling a lot with basketball after 20 years, after 10 years after an ACL or whatever. Uh, even after that first session, his exercises were basically a self pump. So I would get the swelling out in a day versus three weeks, naturally. So same thing with the pumping, right? You start to stimulate the fluid movement through the tubes, through the fascia, and you improve the quality. The, the waste leaves, the nutrients come in. Um, and same thing with the second phase and the third phase. So basically, uh, your immune response is a combination of your vascular system with your immune system, right? The vascular system wants to vasodilate, let all the fluid come in, all the cells come in. And your immune system, in order to do that, needs that, uh, the vascular response of vasodilation to get the job done. Uh, very different when you see a chronic uh, inflammatory condition or immune disorder, because there's a total shift in the uh, cells of the tissue at that point. So the tissue is totally different than acutely. Right, so... Well, and it's getting... And we're, you're this... Your whole immune system, everything is receiving sort of the raw, it's, it's almost like it's just always on alarm. Yeah. You know, it's, that's it's exactly constantly what it stimulated. Right. 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 So constant yeah, at, at that point, it's a mess, which is probably why he always brings up my case. <laughs> yeah, but you said you're doing much better. So, you know, you went from yeah. surgeries to no surgeries. So, you know, um, but yeah, there is a, con there's a shift in cell type, right? So there's more fibroblasts, uh, more macro, more immune cells, more phagocytosis going on. Uh, more fibrosis, scarring is what you get. Um, and that's your body's way of, it's trying to heal and destroy itself at the same time. Mm -hmm. And that, that's really the essence of pumping, uh, is to go along with the inflammatory cycle, understand when it's chronic, what's going on with the tissue and what you can do about it, which is to help to remove the waste, remove the debris, uh, remove the macrophages debris afterwards, get it out of there you know, and, and bring in new fluid, new nourishment. To improve the quality. And so, yeah. And so the next level or next year of the program is fascial normalization. Um, so, you know, what, what does fascial normalization do? Or, or first, what, what really is fascia? You, you kind of touched on it before. Right. Um, but I don't think people really have a full understanding of it because it's so all encompassing, right? Um, so maybe, you know, go ahead and tell us or give us your explanation of what fascia so I'm is. Getting, I'm getting texts of pictures from this uh, video from an Australian guy, so I'm laughing a little bit. Excuse me. But, <laughs> right, so basically, uh, fascial normalization is year two, right? So we have a good understanding of the anatomy, some relationship anatomy. Uh, but this year, we kind of deepen the understanding of, of the fascial chains, of how everything is linked to together. So uh, within the class, there's an organization uh, already pre-made fascial chains that Guy has put together. They're pretty traditional. You find them in a lot of books. I think I've been fortunate to experience learning from Guy both on a private level and uh, in class with him for about eight years now, right? So, um, and he, he used to teach these uh, three base osteopathic chains that I think 
uh, are kind of lost now because he's not teaching really, right? And I think when I, and I actually spent some time just privately with him on this because it was, once I understood these three basic changes of osteopathy, uh, mm -hmm. it all makes sense because that's your base. Uh, if to just learn the, the chains that are in the classes right now the, without learning those three chains, it's almost like you're trying to run before you walk. So mm -hmm. I just want to, I mean, and that, that really plays a role in how I'm treating this COVID patient uh, that I'm going to describe at the end. Uh, but this fundamental three chains in osteopathy, uh, osteopathy are amazing. There's a, basically, there's an anterior higher chain. There's a central mediastinum chain, which the mediastinum is a, the, the space between the lungs, right? It separates the lungs. You have your heart, your aorta, your vagus nerve, phrenic nerve. Uh, it's an important space, and it's really related to the breathing, especially when, you, when you're dealing with somebody with, who just came off a ventilator, like I am right now. But, uh, and then there's also a posterior chain, basically, with a, uh, the ventricular epicranial system, which is cranial sacral therapy. Uh, so I'm going to go over them at the end, because uh, since he stopped teaching, or he hasn't been teaching them as much uh, in the last few years, but I actually, in the initial classes I used to take, when it was still fresh, uh, he used to go over them all the time in Montreal, in uh, New York, LA, even London, I took a course with him. So I think they're important to understand because they give you the foundation from, all, from which all these other chains come from. It's almost rare mm -hmm. that you have to, once you know these three chains, to look anywhere else for the chains. But um, and I'll go over it later, later at the end if uh, you guys stay tuned. So, mm -hmm. all right, so basically, with our fascial treatment, we create, because we understand the links within the fascia, we start to create a framework from where to treat from, right? It doesn't be, it's not just a chaotic, uh, I'll go here, I'll go there, I'll go there. You start to pick a link and you follow it um, based on their symptoms, based on tests that you do, uh, like the pelvic test. Um, and that's basically it. But before you talk about the techniques, you need to talk about what fascia is really, right? So I think that's, a, that's something more important to understand. So when you think of fascia, you think of uh, connective tissue, right? Uh, it links all the structures uh, together, both the orthopedic system and the visceral system. Um, so when you think of fascia, you, you need to think about tendons, ligament, uh, periosteum, the skin of the bones, because really it's a different name, but the lig under a microscope, a ligament and the skin of the bone, the periosteum, you know, ligaments attach bone to bone. And when you follow the ligament to the bone, it's not a different tissue. It has a different... It has still the same three, three things that all fascia has, cells, uh, fibers, and ma extracellular matrix. The, the ratio may be different, so one's a little more dense, one's a little more loose connective tissue, but all of the tissue is the same. Make sense? So, yeah. um, because under, you know, whether you look at the perigardium, the pleura, it's all fascial tissue with the same three components, just different compositions of it. So, um, I lost my train of thought. All right, so basically there's three things that you find in uh, the complexity. Find, yeah. <laughs> What's that? It's easy to lose your train of thought because everything is within the complexity model. Yes, exactly. <laughs> there so you, have things. you have you have cells within the fascia, right? You have fibers and you have uh, extracellular matrix. Uh, so the cells, you have all kinds of cells. Uh, we generally talk about the fibroblasts because that's what makes the collagen tubes. Um, to move the liquid, uh, but you have reticulum fibers uh, for scarring, you have elastin fibers. Um, I'm sorry, I just went to fibers. So we have the cells, fibroblasts, there's a ton of, when we talk about this, this always fascinates me because when we talk about um, cells within the fascia, the immune cells are a huge part of it. So your fascia is linked to your immunity, right? So, you know, the C word for me is petrifying for no other reason mm -hmm. other than uh, I don't know why, but, uh, but you know, you have a, you know, we have cancer cells all day, all the time. It's your immune system's job to catch it, to catch the mitosis gone wild, right? So mm -hmm. these cells, the phagocytosis, by macrophages and everything else, reside within the fascia. So if you have a good quality fascia, you have a much better immune system, right? And that's why you see such a difference with people catching COVID right now. It's, uh, am I shaking in the, in the phone? Yeah. Are you, are you bouncing right, or you're something? hitting the table. Sorry. Okay. So, um, so that, that's what always fascinates me about the cells within the fa uh, fascia. Then you have fibers. You have collagen fibers, elastin fibers, reticular fibers. Uh, the main ones we try to influence, right, at a simple level is the uh, collagen tubes because that's where the water flows through, the fluid. And then you have this extracellular matrix, which contains it all, right? So the extracellular matrix is about 70% water. The rest cells, especially in uh, uh, gags, they're called. And we talk about those more in class. 
Um, but that's the essence of, of the fascia. That's its constituents. Uh, and the different compositions give the tissue a different quality. But it's all the same tissue, right? So your fascia is basically one, two throughout your whole body uh, with a different name, right? Different orientations. Um, okay, so the roles of fascia, there's a lot of roles. The main ones I'm going to just talk about is uh, there's a structural role, right? So it gives you your framework. Remember we said we're not a puddle of water, even though we're 70% by, by weight um, water. So that means all the water is within the fascia, within the, uh, don't forget the, the, the arterial system, the, the skin of it is fascia, right? You have three layers of fascia. The inner has these cells to coagulate. The middle has the contraction to go for vasodilation. That's all in vasoconstriction. That's all fascia. Um, so the structure, of course, is the shape of our butt, the shape of our bicep. Uh, the reason some people can't get a peak in their bicep, etc. The shape of your face, your eyes, your nose. Um, so it, that's, that's a structural component of the fascia via these fibers that it produces. Uh, another role is uh, neurology, no, um, neurologic role, right? So the skin of the nerve is all fascia. Uh, the synapses are embedded in fascia. So the better your, the quality of your fascia is, the better your nervous system can act, react, right? Um, and, and people have taken so much training. That's a great example because I never understood why if I do a myofascial stretch before I do a proprioception, my balance is much better. And it's strictly because the fat, and Guy never explained it, I don't know why, but, or maybe he did, but uh, when you normalize the fascia a little better, your, uh, your ligament can respond better because the ligament has a big neurologic component to it, most of it. Um, another one is uh, communication, right? So all the fascia is in link, all the fluid moves throughout the system. Um, like I said before, the fascia changes name from a ligament to periosteum, but it's the same tissue. Um, a communication between sometimes you have uh, a nerve and artery and uh, a vein all grouped together and embedded with fascia, right? Uh, sometimes mm -hmm. you might have this, like the sciatic nerve, for instance, right? Uh, you have fascia around the sciatic nerve uh, coming under the piriformis. If the fibers get sticky and the fascia gets stuck to the piriformis fascia, right? And the piriformis fascia is in link with the glute med. And if you have, a, if you if you start to use your piriformis muscle, your glute med, and the tissue is all stuck together, you're gonna you're gonna affect the sciatic nerve, right? So you might excite the sciatic nerve, and that's what they start to talk about when you talk about piriformis syndrome and etc. It's it's the tissue layers that are adhered. Uh, what else? Uh, and again, immunity and defense, right? So you have you have a lot of adipo, uh, adipose cells in the fascia, which uh, help to bursa which are for protection, right? You have a lot of the immune cells that we talked about within the bursa. Um, so th those are the main roles. There's a few other roles as well, but um, just for the sake of time, that's what we're doing. Um, and now for the technique, right? So that's, that was fashion, the different mm -hmm. roles and the different constituents. Uh, so we have this methodology. It's, uh, we use an acronym, right? It's I-D-A-I. -I. So it's, a, it's a intention, duplication, attention, and induction, okay? So uh, what we work on when, when we do fascia normalization or when we do pumping or double TLS or anything manual really is uh, fascia has two properties. It has a thixotropy property, if I said that right, and the piezoelectric property. And what all that means is um, it's, it's the movement, it's how your, your fluid uh, within fascia moves, right? So it's constantly in a, a changing state uh, from a, a, a viscous, gelated, or gelation stage to a less viscous, more fluid stage of solation. Uh, it's not, this is not terms just for osteopath, osteopathy, but for example, the easiest way to understand it is uh, when you buy a uh, thing of paint, right? You want to paint the ceiling. Uh, you need to mix the paint, right? So at first, when you open it, it's very viscous. That's a gelated mm -hmm. state. So when we mix it, we actually change the molecular structure to become more fluid. So if it was ever painted, that's an easy way to understand. You need to mix the fluid first. So same thing you're doing. There's a constant shift from a gelated viscous state to a solated uh, fluid state of the fascia, right? And that's what we're influencing. And obviously everybody knows we have a, like an electrical component to our tissue, right? Uh, that's the whole thing with all this 5G and everything else people are talking about that I don't understand. But, um, so that's basically what we're working on. And with the methodology of IDAI, uh, the I is the intention, right? So we need like a, a goal. Do we want to stimulate the liquid through the tube? Do we want to exchange the nutrients, the waste, or 
Do we want to speed up the PRM or the rhythm of the, the gelase, uh, gel and so? Um, then here's the hardest part really is the duplication, right? The D. Duplication just means, um, let's say this, um, we need to know the anatomy very well. We need to know the direction of the fascia, which direction the tubes run, um, the links, all that. So you do have to spend time and commit to learning the anatomy and the relationship anatomy. Um, the next one is uh, attention. So we need to be uh, precise with our hands. We need to know where the ligament is. Uh, do we want to work in the superficial fascia with the pressure? Do we want to work in the deeper fascia? Um, so these are all things that you need to start thinking about when you're doing a technique. And induction is um, how to move the fluid. You learn to move it mechanically or with the PRM or primary respiratory uh, uh, mechanism. Uh, if you're not familiar with that, this is basically um, in utero, that's the first way you breathe. It's the movement of the fluid in utero before you actually breathe the uh, air when you're born. So that, that's, uh, that's the acronym we use, right? So the goal is always though, to balance the tension and the, pen, uh, the pressure in a tensegrity type of uh, structure. So that's always our goal when we're, when we're doing the fashion realization. Excellent. And what about year number three, TTLM? So the so, first, first two years are, I think you always say they're a little bit more, um, I don't want to say mechanical, but it's like where you do more of the work. So well, the first two years are actually um, totally different than third year. The third year is actually very mechanic, right? So it, it's a lot less fluidic, a lot. It's just basically, it's a hard technique. Um, mm -hmm. there's, there's different ways we, we, um, we use double PLS, right? Um, we use it on ligaments and we use it on tendons, basically. So uh, we can do a passive version of it, which is called TMS transversal muscular stretching, where we actually try to separate the different tendons, the different fibers, a uh, classic example for uh, tennis elbow, right? Where to try and separate all the extensor uh, tendons from the flexor tendons from the interosseous membrane. So that's TMS, that's a passive version of double TLS. Um, then we have an active version, right? So we use that on ligaments and tendons to basically um, inhibit the nervous system before we adjust uh, so if you're a Cairo, it's a great tool because if you've ever been adjusted, you know how um, guarded you are when you're adjusted. So this technique actually decreases the reflex of Sherrington's, the Golgi, all that to allow you to adjust more precisely and much easier. Sometimes you just put them into the position of tension and they self-adjust. Um, what else? So the, the other way we use it is, uh, again, on ligaments and tendons, we use it transversely. We're trying to improve... Um, the quality of the tissue, right? So we're trying to, to, uh, to move the fluid. Uh, for example, um, because we know all the fascia has consists of the same components, right? We want to move uh, the fluid through the collagen tube. We move the waste primarily exchange for the nutrients. That's our main goal with the double TLS as well. Uh, we know it has a neurologic component, right? So when we work with the ligament uh, and we start to normalize the collagen tube, the extracellular matrix, uh, the connection with the nerve, then you improve the, the efficiency of the ligament. Um, it has a great effect if you understand how to apply it with a, a sprain of a ligament, right? So you sprain the ankle, the anterior tail fib ligament that we talked about in the beginning. Uh, you can do double TLS to the ligament to start to improve or speed up the healing process because you're exchanging the fluid, exchanging the nutrients uh, through the collagen tubes. Um, so basically, that's what we're doing. We're improving the sensitivity of the ligament and tendon by improving the quality of the, of the uh, tissue. And that's double TLS, really. And then the theories where you're that tie everything together are the diaphragm. For me, and, was, yeah. Yeah, and I, I think that um, when people hear diaphragm, they they think one thing and then when they come to the courses, they experience something completely different because they realize how much that affects everything. And so um, let's go through what the diaphragm courses, you know, are like, which cover the uh, okay. thoracic, cervical, thoracic, pelvic, and cranial diaphragm. Okay. Uh, okay. So before you talk, this, this definitely is the year that brings it all together, but it brings it together if you understand those three chains I talked about, right? 
So when you talk about like, we have a cervical thoracic diaphragm, which is highly involved with the hyoid bone, right? Um, but to understand what the hyoid chain is first, anterior, the anterior hyoid chain, the mediastin middle and the posterior uh, ventricular chain, right? Is what really puts all the diaphragms to make sense. So for instance, uh, with the, the base, uh, with these three osteopathic chains, you have the anterior hyoid chain, right? You can actually, and when we talk about chain, we just talk about following the links, right? The connections between the different tissues. Uh, that's all the chain is. So if you follow, for example, the anterior, uh, the anterior of the hyoid chain, this bone here, which is remarkable because there's over 40 muscles and ligaments that attach to this little bone. And it's super important in terms of uh, getting a lot of information for your posture, for your balance, for your gravity line. Um, so that's always something that you check. Um, so basically, if you follow the anterior hyoid chain, you, you start at the terion, which is just a, just the name given to the um, where where the frontal bone, parietal bone, the temporal bone, the sphenoid, they all meet right at the junction of the skull. And if you follow that down to the styloid process, to the mandible, to the hyoid bone, from there you have links or expansions that you can follow to the upper limbs, right, via the uh, Gerdes fascia, which is a uh, fascia of the pec, uh, LeBlanc fascia, the uh, fascia of the lat. Um, but more importantly, with the uh, hyoid chain, you have a, what's called the middle circle fascia. This is what we were talking about with you to treat. Is, um, so in the we said you have your heart, your aorta, your uh, front neck and vagus nerve. And then you follow that through the, with, by the thyroid to the pericardium, um, to the diaphragm, right? So from the diaphragm, you can follow it to different places. You can follow it to the xiph xiphoid fascia, to the... Uh, solar plexus area, right, which is an important uh, ganglion, sympathetic ganglion in front of the vertebrae, uh, metabolism, uh, linked with the adrenal glands, uh, blood pressure, really important for the client I, I, I was just going to talk about. Um, so this chain is super important with immunity. Um, and then you can follow that link uh, to the pelvic diaphragm. So there's a direct link from the cervical spine to the pelvic diaphragm. Mm -hmm. And that's how the diaphragms make sense. Without teaching those, and, and I'm definitely going to incorporate these into the New York and Dallas program, because if you don't incorporate those, and you don't get those foundations, I think it's a, you'll never get the, the program, really. You know, you'll, you'll still be a great therapist because you'll have, the techniques are amazing by themselves, but to understand right. these chains is, is huge. But then from the higher bone, you can also follow it to the superficial fascia, the abs, the obliques, down to the iguanal ligament, down to the uh, pubis, right? And then those chains you learn about in class for the lower limb makes sense because then they go out from the SI joint, the pubis, the coccyx, to the coccyx femoral joint, to the leg, and you can follow it back up. Um, so that's the answer chain. Then you have a mediastinum chain that I'll talk about more with uh, my client. But basically, uh, you follow that, again, with the, the SBS, the connection of the osteoporotic, the sphenoid, straight down to the middle cervical fascia, to the diaphragm. Uh, from the diaphragm, um, you could actually follow... Uh, via the round ligament to, to the uracus, to the bladder, to the pubis, you follow uh, basically the, the diaphragm has a direct attachment to your bladder, to your pubis. So any disruption, and with the pericardium above, so if you have a very tight diaphragm, like a lot of people do, uh, that's going to directly influence everything above it, uh, your pericardium, your heart. And he always says, you know, because the structure governs the function, especially in today's people sit all day, they're on computers all day, you like this. Uh, you, you can't ask your heart or your lungs to really function efficiently when they're completely mm -hmm. compressed when the pericardium mm -hmm. is forward with and yeah you go get a pacemaker you know to normalize your arrhythmia you go get thyroid medication or because your, your thyroid is so compressed between c7 c6 c5 um so that that's the links and the ventricular system is basically the cranial diaphragm but again there's links between the posterior chain and the anterior chain and the lower limbs and uh vice versa so those are the links i think uh, at least in this program, we're definitely going to teach in Dallas, but uh, they're important. Because then now to talk about diaphragms is easy, right? So you have a cervical thoracic diaphragm over here, uh, the, the cranial diaphragm up here. So basically in the in the cra uh, cervical thoracic diaphragm, we have three parts. You have the um, styloid uh, diaphragm, which is basically in link with your TMJ, with your temporal bone, with the cranial diaphragm, um, with the mandible, um, you have the bottom part of the diaphragm, which is the bourgeoisie diaphragm, basically linking your cervical spine to your pleura, the lung, the skin of the lung. Uh, and then you have all these spaces. And in the neck, you have a huge tensegrity um, biomechanics of the muscular system. They cross in every different direction. And that's really to maintain the curves of the neck. 
so when you when you do this fourth year, you're mixing all your techniques together. You do when you come to a joint, you're doing the pumping. When you go, come to tissue, you're doing fascial organization. Uh, so that's how this, the diaphragms link everything together. You know, so you have that cervical thoracic diaphragm, uh, really important because you have a, a lot of important vasculature in there. Right, you have your carotid arteries, your uh, subclavian, your uh, uh, vein, jugular vein, uh, phrenic nerve, all of it. I mean, uh, uh, vagus nerve. Uh, then you move down to the thoracic diaphragm. Everybody knows that. It's the breathing muscle, right? So uh, you start to learn all the links. Uh, basically, the diaphragm of the liver, the diaphragm of the uh, stomach, the diaphragm of the spleen, the diaphragm with the pericardium, uh, the diaphragm uh, via the link to the pelvic diaphragm, right? Uh, either deep via the pillars or uh, uh, more superficially by the um, uracus, the uh, round ligament. So you start to understand that, uh, you know, I recently had a, a, a young girl, like a 30 year old that was car accident, they removed half her liver. She came in completely side bend. Without this knowledge of understanding, okay, does she have a foul support? Did they remove it? Uh, what's the connection with the pelvis and, and all that? There's no way you treat her. And it's kind of like almost, in, it grows your business just that way because nobody else is doing that. Very few people, these people are right. like, they're doing visceral work. It's, you know, and that's basically and the pelvic diaphragm is the pelvic diaphragm is just, uh, it's, it's really, this is a really fascinating one actually because you link your sacroiliac joint with your pelvic floor. And you realize that movements of your, of your hip because you can't separate the uh, hip joint from the pelvis from the lumbar spine, uh, move your viscera or move your uh, pelvic floor. So somebody who has like, a, let's say a sacroiliac problem or an inflare, an outflare or a nutcracker or something, uh, you know, I always get clients, uh, you know, they're not coming in for constipation, they're not coming in for, uh, go in the bathroom uh, using the bladder too much, but that's a byproduct of correcting the sacroiliac problem. Like, oh my God, I'm mm -hmm. constipated. But there's a lot of facts that go into it too, so don't take that face value. Right. Uh, and that's the diaphragm, basically. It puts it all uh, all together. And so now that you've taken us through each series of the program, can you, Terry, give us a couple of case studies um, and, and how a traditional PT would approach them versus a SOMA practitioner, a SOMA therapist. Okay, yeah. Um, so let's talk about, I'll do, I'll do one for patellofemoral syndrome and I'll do one that that's actually a real client right now. Um, so <laughs> young guy, 45, uh, physician from the city, uh, ended up on a ventilator for 12 days with COVID, right? 12 days is a very long time to be a ventilator. It's almost unheard of. Uh, yeah. less than 20% make it, you know, so he actually made it. So he was going for PT, um, I don't know, like twice a week for a month, I think, before I saw him. So PT, what it was, what was it doing? It was, uh, they were walking him, stairs, squats, uh, putting him on the bike, uh, really no understanding of the relationships of what a ventilator did to him, what COVID possibly did to him. So he comes in, his main complaints are, uh, he can't breathe. He has a really hard time breathing. He's got sciatic on the right side. Um, when I take his, uh, his resting pulse, it's over 100. His blood pressure is high. So all these things you've got to now start to think about with the nervous system, with the autonomic nervous system, what's going on. So right away, I'm just, you know, A, you assess the pelvis because I always do. That's my first step. We correct the inflare. We correct some of the sciatic. And not my priority at this point. Maybe give him a way to get out of the pain. But my first priority is to, to look at the mediastian chain, right? That we just talked about, which is directly linked Terry, to the lung. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. It looks like we have eight seconds left. Um, oh, eight seconds. That's so okay. I'm just gonna, I'll end this now and start a new one. So I need to start to work on the uh, cervical thoracic diaphragm, right? Because he was vented. So I need to work on the entire styloid diaphragm, the brugerie diaphragm. And I need to work my way down towards the diaphragm through the mediastian chain. And just by having these links, even in front of me on a piece of paper, I understand where my treatment approach can go, right? To get him on the bike doesn't make sense. Uh, theoretically, it makes sense, but if he doesn't have the capacity for the diaphragm, it might make it worse. Uh, and you constantly recheck the, and what you want to see during the treatment, you follow diaphragm down to the pelvic floor, you follow it to the pericardium, you follow it, and all these links with these three base chains is how I went about my treatment. So I'm working with the cervical thoracic diaphragm, with the thoracic diaphragm, um, with the pelvic diaphragm, and I'm using double TLS. I'm working the intercostals, the, uh, uh, all, all the rib pumping, all the uh, double TLS for the intercostals, uh, the fascia normalization for the uh, xiphoid chain and the, uh, uh, the mediastian chain for the diaphragm. 
Um, so that's the way I'm going about it. And it's a much different approach and a much more effective because he, he walks out of there and he's, he's like, he can breathe. Whether it's for an hour, whether it's for three hours, I don't know the extent of the damage, but I give him some exercise to do to maintain it. Um, and that's a more intelligent way of going about it rather than have the guy walk stairs or, you know, climb, uh, you know, climb, do squats or standing hip abduction. That doesn't really make sense. Um, it's also, you know, he had, they had him walking for hours. I mean, it's more, more important for him to almost like pump the central nervous system, the ANS, by walking, you know, because walking is a natural, almost reciprocal girdle motion. So you get some rotation of the vertebrae uh, to pump the ANS in front of it. So th that's how I go when about this one. Um, a more classic example, let's say, uh, let's take patellofemoral pain syndrome, right? Everybody's familiar with it, pain in the anterior knee, sometimes pain in the medial knee. Um, so typically what I've done in the past, and I thought I was good, is I would stretch the hamstrings, strengthen the quads, uh, stretch the quads, uh, you know, some straight leg raises, some modalities. Uh, but that doesn't make sense to them in retrospect because it's much more complex, right? You have so many other interactions with, with why you're getting patellofemoral pain syndrome. So my first, uh, what you learn in this course is to assess the pelvis in the uh, third year. Each year, actually, we assess and we learn to assess. I think we did it last course in bumping uh, <laughs> to start to go over the oblique axis, the AP axis of the pelvis. So in my example, let's say this is a made up example. Um, she's got uh, knee pain. I don't look at the knee really. I move the knee because it's not gonna tell me much. I look above or below. So for me, I looked above, I looked at the pelvis. I found he has what's called, and these are terms in PT school, Cairo, osteopathic, there's nothing uh, just for this program. But he's got a negative torsion, let's say, on the left oblique axis, right? Which means his sacrum is backwards, okay? Right, so the ilium now, your iliac bone has gone down and forward. Uh, so right there, it gives me a lot of information of what's going above and what's going on below with the soft tissue, right? So that's, that's my approach. So now I know because the ilium is an outflare, I know the femoral bone because I know the orientation of the hip joint has rotated inwards. Because I know that, I know the, the tibia has also rotated inwards, but relatively external. So I know the, ang the Q angle has increased, right? And when you, when you know what the Q angle, the, the bigger the Q angle, the more the patella wants to go lateral, okay? Uh, then I can follow the whole chain down to the calcaneus, the internal rotation of the tibia, the calcaneus valgus, et cetera. So I know, I have an idea, of, depending on how long this has been going on, what the tissue quality or what the imbalances will be in the tissue. So my first step is I go to my pumping course, right? I do, I pump uh, the sacroiliac joint, the greater arm, the lesser arm, apex, the sacrospine, uh, this uh, sacroiliac, uh, SI posterior ligaments, SI anterior ligaments. I maybe do some double TLS. I adjust the ilium, right? I adjust the pelvis. Um, that's step one. So I correct the outflare. Okay, so now I come down I go down to the glute. So now, because I know he's been in inflate, I know the glute, the deltoid or the, or the ITB muscles have been in tension, more the back part of it, the glute, glute uh, max mm -hmm. fibers, right? So I know I got to do maybe some uh, fashion to the whole deltoid or the glute me, the um, superficial glute max, the TFL, uh, to change the tension in the ITB. Uh, versus like you see a lot of people, they just foam roll, uh, which makes no sense because that means they haven't understood anything about the fascia. Uh, and actually, uh, one of my colleagues uh, has put up a good video, I think Dan did, about foam rolling versus stretching. Yeah. I don't remember, it was a few years back, but um, check it out. So, uh, it's a good video. Actually. I remember sending that video to my uh, couple of trainer friends of mine. And once they, that sort of just opened up a whole bubble for them. And yeah, it's, they, it's they, they just couldn't believe how, how often they had people on a foam roller and they'll never right. do it again. <laughs> yeah. I never used it since, but... Um, so, mm -hmm. so you start to understand the relationship, right, of, the, of what's going on with the tension of the muscle based on the uh, biomechanics of, of what's in the pelvis or the SI joint. Uh, and that, that's your thinking. Then I need to check the muscles, right? So I know because he's got this, had this Q, increased Q angle, a lot of force in the patella laterally, right? I want to reinforce the VMO. In, in the past, I would have just strengthened the quads. But knowing now that you have six quads or five quads, each with a different uh, vector pull all lateral though, except for this little muscle called the VMO. So we reinforce the VMO. I know the VMO, the antagonistic muscle is, is the glute max, right? Because the posterior part of the, the superficial part of the glute max attaches to the patella and will pull the patella laterally, right? By the expansion. So I know I might need to stretch the superficial glute max, the deep glute max, uh, and I follow up the chain. So I reinforce the VMO, I stretch the superficial glute max. 
Uh, I know I have to do something with my sacroiliac joint, right? Because I just corrected it. So maybe I have to reinforce the two antagonistic, again, the glute max, superficial, with the piriformis. So you see the different muscles, like the, the, the ITB is really misunderstood, but it's, it's fundamental in terms of your hip stability and your knee. Um, to, if you understand the uh, deltoid of Fargo and the tricuspid tibialis or the ITB, it's a big link between the pelvis and the, uh, the knee to the tibia. So it has a big, uh, a lot of roles actually. And I can, that could be a whole other subject of this, but I know I need to uh, possibly reinforce the piriformis, stretch the glute max again. Uh, I might want to look at my glute med and my uh, vastus lateralis because they work in unison. So it's these kind of connections that I would have never in a million years thought of connecting. Like who would think to connect the glute with the VMO? It makes no sense until you know what the anatomy is or the, what the relationship anatomy is. Um, right. and, that, and that's how you go about doing it. Uh, and once you learn that, uh, it's, it's so easy. But to be honest with you, it really comes down to um, studying the anatomy, the relationship of anatomy, and understanding um, these three basic uh, osteopathic chains, uh, because it makes it so much easier to figure out the rest. And the only comment I want to leave you at is um, just because it helps. Like, somebody had told me this early on, right? It would have helped. Uh, our whole goal in this program is to really improve the gravity line, our, pos our posture, our structure. So structure governs function, um, because that improves our functionality between the visceral and the orthopedic system. So. That makes a lot of sense to me. So my first goal is structural. Mm -hmm. I always want to fix the structure. I adjusted the outflare before I did anything else. Um, and that way, we have a good gravity line. And the, and the quality of our gravity line or our, our structure basically depends on the diaphragms, the, 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 the tension and the pressure of this, all the structures within the diaphragms. And to me, that makes the most sense um, if how to describe the program as a leading note. <laughs> Well, I'm sure we could all keep listening to a bunch of different cases and and the sort of more beneficial ways to approach them and what to look at instead um, versus the standard ways. But I think this is a good place to wrap up. And Can I just I want one thing? After, yeah. So like, can I just went, um, actually, we're, me, me and a good friend of mine, um, he's referred to as the amazing Paul from Vancouver for whatever reason. Yeah. Uh, we actually put together a little program to incorporate yes. all these, uh, all these um, uh, relationships into an exercise program. So check it out. Uh, first, so where, can, where can everybody so, find, or, or find more to, information you, on that? You can go to rehabroom, rehabroom.ca, uh, hit join online classes. Uh, we have a lot of information on there, and people love the classes. It's just a good way to incorporate the entire program in it. But just don't steal the stuff. I could vouch, aside from Terry, Paul is pretty amazing to learn from. So, so that, that, uh, that is highly recommended for sure. Um, Terry, thank you so much for walking us through the whole program. Um, I'm looking forward to some more chats. And if anyone's interested in learning more about the New York Soma Therapy Program, our website is somaeducationalgroup.com. And if you have any questions, you can email me directly at info at somaeducationalgroup.com. And aside from New York, um, there's a few other locations that are offering the program as well. Um, so starting with, I know you will be teaching also, Terry, in Dallas. At, I'm, I'm um, teaming up with Scott, right? Scott from yeah, Dallas. At, Legacy. at Legacy and wellness and uh, you can find those course offerings or information on them at legacyperformwell.com um let's see on the west coast i believe in santa Ana is link medical center um we're actually one of our new york graduates jason jason Amstutz, uh is teaching there and you can find those course offerings at linkmedicalcenter.com um, let's see, in Fort Lauderdale, uh, we have another New York graduate of ours, uh, PT Don Rourke. He's teaching at H3, or Holistic Health. Um, so you can find those courses or information on them at h3bydan.com. I think and... they're on channel two right now, actually. Sorry? That's just okay. That's okay. What did you say? It's just a joke, nothing. 
and uh, and across the pond, we've got in the UK um, another one of our graduates yeah, is Peter Bowden, Peter Bowden, and he is actually hosting Guy Voyer, and that's sort of the only place that Guy is able to <laughs> offer the program right now. And you can find information on that uh, at somatraining.co.uk. Um, and also at Soma Education Vancouver on Facebook. Um, I don't know if there's a course schedule right now, but I believe. For Paul, you mean? Yeah, for Paul. Yeah, so, I don't know if he's got days, but it's going to be going on there. So. Yeah, so, so the program will be available soon, hopefully, in Vancouver. Um, and so that's at Soma Education Vancouver on Facebook, I believe. And. Um, Hopefully we can get started, get, you know, resume our courses soon, maybe September, October, but we're kind of just taking it day by day and it's got to be really, really safe um, for all of us to get back together and keep the program going. Right now we're in the fascia level, fascial normalization. So, oh, and Terry, we, <laughs> if people want to learn more about you and how to book sessions um, with you. You can check out uh, SomaFitPT.com, uh, but really just uh, email Ashley if you guys have any questions on uh, other treatments or have questions on techniques or want to go over anything else. Uh, you know, we got nothing but time right now, for now at least. So yeah, feel free to email Ashley at I think whatever the email is, Soma Educational Group, uh, if you guys want anything else uh, done or talked about. Yeah, please email us. We, I have a, a few more um, really fun sort of uh, or very informational interviews coming up. But if there's anything pertaining to the soma therapy that you had more questions about, please email me at info at stomaeducationalgroup.com. And Terry and I would love to get on here and give you as much information as we can. So. Terry, stay safe. I'll thank you. Stay you safe, later. everyone. Thank you. And everybody, thank you so much for joining us, and please stay safe. Bye.